colleagues who came today to spend the evening despite it's a holiday tomorrow. Um, my friends and family and students are here. So I, I must say it's a bit weird to see all of you gathered in one room. <laughs> but, but thank you so much for showing up. I appreciate it. So Charlotte took us to something huge. I would like to take you to something very small. And I would like to start with um, talking about a case that was presented in a uh, documentary in DR a couple of years ago. So this is Matilde. Matilde was on her way home from school. She was 17 years old back then. And she was, she was on her way from school when, uh, when she caught her hand on a bottle. Then she went to ER and they gave her some stitches and they cleaned her wound and they sent her home. And everything was fine, but then the next day her hand were, was swollen and it hurt very bad. So she went back to the hospital and they looked at it and said, okay, yeah, it's red. They cleaned it up and sent her home again. At home, her condition worsened. She began to, to feel nauseous. She, she felt really bad. The pain was even worse than before. And she actually also vomited blood. She called ER. She called the on-call doctors. They told her to take some painkillers and sleep on it. But it wasn't until she uh, fainted that they took her into the hospital opened her wound in, uh, in surgery and found that her flesh was dead and that she was infected by flesh-eating bacteria. The only solution to save her life was to amputate her arm. So there was actually nothing to do at this point. But the case with Mathilde is probably due to resistant bacteria. We don't know that because I, I don't know her medical uh, journal, but I know that one third of all infections that cause uh, flesh eating uh, infections are actually due to resistant bacteria. And resistance is a problem that occur with bacteria and it's not necessarily when it's something that is so life threatening. It can also be something that is more mild, but it's all that bad because if we have no options to treat, it can end really badly. The World Health Organization is talking about a post-antibiotic era. They have predicted that in less than 30 years, we will run out of antibiotics that are efficient. And in consequence, we will end up with antibiotic resistance as the most, as the highest cause of, of death in the world. So now we have said that antibiotic resistance is a problem, but what, what is it really? What is it that is happening with, with bacteria when they become resistant? Um, bacteria, they can actually be resistant, become resistant just by themselves, naturally. And they have been doing that all since the beginning of time. So bacteria, they live in different types and they have different um, families and different um, we can think of them like us. They have different cultures, different different type of, of, of identity. And when they live together, they also compete sometimes. They compete about the resources. And in order to, to survive, they, they kind of fight. And part of this fight is to send toxins to each other, to kill each other. These toxins are the ones that we utilize as antibiotics. And in order for them to survive these attacks, then they develop resistance. So it's ways to resist these toxins that come close to them. And some, some, uh, some examples of resistance or some examples of, uh, yeah, some examples of resistance to antibiotics. It could be that they, that they build a fence around them, something jelly, uh, sticky. It can, it can, um, it can protect them from the attack from toxins. So it's difficult for the toxins to penetrate to them. And another way they can do is to, uh, to demolish the antibiotics when they come close. So kind of a missile defense system. But my personal favorite is when they actually get it inside their cell, they also are able to pump it out again. So th they are very smart and they can do many different, different ways uh, to protect themselves. 
The main problem is when we use antibiotics in such an extensive way that we accelerate this process. And we have only used antibiotics for less than 100 years. And in this time frame, we have enabled them to develop resistance mechanisms so quickly that it's not even worth it for us to develop new antibiotics. It is so economically inefficient for us to develop new antibiotics because the bacteria will just find a quick new way to resist them. So we have a real problem. But when we think about the antibiotic resistance problem, what is, what is the real problem with them? Is it just that they are able to resist attacks from us? What if good bacteria are resistant? Is that a problem? The answer to this is yes, it is a problem because resistance can be transferred from, from bacteria to others. So good bacteria could transfer resistance to bad bacteria. Now the real problem is when, back, when resistance fall into wrong hands. And the wrong hands here are the bad bacteria. So what is the problem with the bad bacteria? What is it that they, they can do? It is to be pathogenic. They cause disease, they cause harm to our cells when they enter our body. So it could be producing toxins that damage our cells, or it could be producing biofilms that clog our system, for example, our airways, and make us make it difficult for us to breathe. So for bacteria, when we think about it really, it is that bacteria's harm causing effects, that's the real problem. Your actions define you, the same goes for bacteria, it's the, their actions that are the problem. And what is a bit controversial to say is, maybe bacteria can be as resistant as they want as long as they don't harm us. This is the approach I work with in my lab. We try to find strategies to, to defeat bacteria that are bad for us. Instead of just killing them, we try to find ways to lower their pathogenic activity, their disease-causing activity. But to do this, we need to understand bacteria in kind of a different way. We need to understand them like, like societies, like real cultures. We need to study them and understand how they communicate with each other. Because in the case of Matilde, how is it even possible that something that is so small and invisible can turn a human being from being very healthy to deadly sick? How is it at all possible that this can happen? The reason it can happen is that bacteria, they talk to each other and they, and they coordinate their activities before they do this much harm. Because in the beginning, when they enter the body, if they just use all, all their weapons at once, it will just have no effect. They are very few, we are large, and on top of that, we have a, an immune system that could kill them immediately if they just show off the, the minute they come in. Their trick is whenever, when they come into the body, they lay low. They grow and grow and grow, and then and, and in this time frame, they, their pathogenic activity is zero. Then the second they reach a threshold, so they count each other, they tell each other how many are we, is, are we enough? The second they reach a specific threshold, then they all at once synchronize their activity and start producing pathogenic behavior. And this trick allows them to be really deadly to us. So all of this is based on them talking to each other on a molecular level. It is bacteria sending signals, one cell sending signal to another cell. This cell receives the signal and sends a response to the other cell. So what if there are no receptors on the cells? What if they cannot hear each other? What would happen? What do you think would happen if they cannot hear each other? Exactly. They will not be able to coordinate their activities. And when they are not able to coordinate their activities, maybe we can do this deliberately and slow them in the process of, of infection. And this is what we work with here. So one thing is to block their communication. Another way is to confuse them. We could, instead of just um, blocking their, their reception or their uh, ability to, to send out signals, we could send some signals that look a bit like their 
their communication signals, but are completely out of context. So they would be confused. They wouldn't know where did this come from? Is it another community? What should we do? They wouldn't know this. And in this way, we could confuse them and make them slow down their processes. Another way is to introduce a culture change. So what if we introduced a bad behaving culture uh, we introduced them to, to some benign cultures, some cultures that actually behave well. How would they then act if they can switch or learn something from them? This is another strategy. And finally, we could tame them. Instead of just killing them, we can try to train them to be less pathogenic. But all of this, it requires that we are able to monitor them. We're able to actually see how they behave and how they respond to our treatment. And the thing with bacteria, when you start measuring them, they pose for you. They, <laughs> they don't really just show the real picture because when you measure on bacteria, you will have to take them out of context, maybe kill them or fil filtrate them out, treat them chemically, do all sort of stuff. We know how it is in the lab. It's completely insane. And in the end, when you get some, some, uh, some results out, they may mimic the picture we think they are in, but it's not really close. So if we really would like to monitor cultures and see how they behave, we need some tools that are not as con conventional as we have today. And I've, la I've used the last 10 years on on uh, developing some technology that enable us to monitor cells in another way than we, we can today. Here we have a sensor. It's a chip that is modified with nanotechnology on the surface. This could be with antibodies or other, other uh, topography. And this enable us to capture specific molecules of interest, these communication molecules or some of the toxins they produce. And based on that, we can get a spectrum of specific chemicals we would like to measure. All of this can happen instantly, so we don't need to modify our cells. We can, so to speak, just take a drop, measure, see what is going on immediately with our culture. As a spin-off of, of this technology, we have been able to, to diagnose or, or at least detect um, infections early. We have been able to modify this technique to detect even coronavirus, um, to detect bacteria in the environment. And also as a new thing, we have been able to, to work on prostate cancer um, and, and diagnose or at least try to differentiate between early stage prostate cancer and late stage, stage prostate cancer. So, so there are many opportunities with, the, with this technique, but this is not the topic of this. Uh, we could take it another time. But what, what we would like to do with this is to see, can we observe bacteria and see how they behave and, and, and based on that, decide on a strategy for eradicating them. So I'm not going to talk about the confusion of bacteria. I'm not going to talk about the block, uh, blocking of communication. I'm going to talk about culture change and taming bacteria. So let's start with the culture change here. Before we, uh, I show you some of the experiments we have done, um, the thing with bacteria is that they, they have faced sometimes some of the same dilemmas we have. So is it one single cell's best interest or is it the community's best interest? How would they behave in a situation where they can actually pick what to do? And Bacteria, they can have sometimes in a culture, they, ha they, have, they have to all contribute to sustain this culture. So they need to produce public goods. It could be something that they all benefit from, something that hel help them um, defeat attacks from the outside. All sort of stuff that keep their community. Sometimes single cells realize that they can like close their production and in this way, they save energy, but they can still take from everyone else. So this is also a strategy they use. And in this way, they prioritize their own interest above the common good. A society can take that. The problem is when more cheaters appear in, in this community. And this has been well described in economy theory, which we actually borrow here when we look at bacteria. 
So this, in economy theory, there's this famous example of, uh, of um, a field, a grass field. There are four, four herdsmen and they all have, they have decided that they use two cows on this field each. It's fine, then one of the herdsmen uh, decide that he can just sneak one extra cow into the field. It will be no real problem for, for the overall, but uh, the cost of this will be shared by all four herdmen. So he can do this, no problem. But the problem is when the others, they realize, okay, he did it, I can do it too. So they start putting more cows in and more cows in. And in the end, it, it means that the, there are so limited resources that all the cows die. This is the, the dilemma and this is called the tragedy of the commons. And this also happens with bacteria. If they all cheat, the system collapse. But what is good for bacteria or what is bad for bacteria is good for us. So how can we use that for our benefit? And here I'm going to show you an example where we measure uh, bacterial growth and we measure uh, uh, or we measure bacterial growth against time, and we also measure the pathogenic activity of bacteria. And we have used two types of bacteria. It's the exact same bacteria, only one is pathogenic and it's resistant, and the other one is the same, but it's just, it had, it, it's a cheater. It doesn't produce this pathogenic activity. So what we see here is that we have an established culture, and we have a culture that we let grow slowly into the established culture. So we make them grow into a steady state. And then when they are mixed, oh, sorry. And in this, in this uh, specific interval, the pathogenic activity is fairly high. Then they grow together. They become one culture. And in this, in this time frame, after they are steady state, then the pathogenic activity declines uh, significantly. It actually declines with 77% in this specific experiment. So this is an example of how we can lower the overall pathogenic activity just by introducing a cheater strain. This, this, uh, this trick here or this, uh, this uh, strategy here is called a cheetah invasion because we let cheaters invade an established culture. So this is one thing we could do. Another thing we could do is to tame bacteria. And this is the project that uh, I'll be working on here with the support of uh, Loyal UNESCO. So with taming bacteria, uh, there, there's a speculation of how antibiotics or how bacteria they respond to antibiotics that don't kill them. So we, we all get, uh, we have tried to, to have an antibiotic course. And the thing is, when you, when you take the antibiotic, the local infection inside you, it doesn't re really have reach the, or the antibiotics don't reach it in the same amount that it, that it's supposed to. It reaches it by a gradient, reaches it slowly. So the bacteria will only feel a gradient of antibiotic exposure, meaning that sometimes they feel antibiotic exposure that is below than what kills them. This is what we see here. So if we look at the antibiotic concentration here, and we have a, a certain level of death, then everything below, what happens below, that's, that's what's really interesting. Because one thing they could do is that they develop resistance, so they genetically mutate, and then they are able to defeat any more an, uh, antibiotic um, attacks. Another thing they could do is that they they become persistent, so they tolerate more antibiotic, a higher antibiotic concentration without dying. Here they are not genetically modified, but they, they are just, they are just a bit stronger. So this, this is the picture, uh, if they are receiving antibiotic concentrations less than what kills them. If we look at, if we look at the corresponding pathogenic activity in this frame, then we see another pattern. We made some experiments to see, okay, so what would happen if they went to the pathogenic activity, not to the resistance? And what we uh, hypothesized was that what doesn't kill them, make them stronger. So we thought 
that it would increase their virulence activity. And we could actually see that here to some strains that were already producing um, um, toxins. And when we expose them to one specific antibiotic, then they increase their pathogenic activity. So what doesn't kill them make them stronger. But when we have the same bacteria and we expose them to, to other sort of antibiotics, then we find that it could also knock them out. It could also lower their virulence activity and their pathogenic activity. So we thought this field is extremely interesting because if we actively can expose them to very, very small doses of antibiotics without killing them, then maybe we can just make them more tame. Then we looked into what others have done on this. and We realized the picture is like this. And it's not an IQ test, so don't try to solve it. We, we found that it's just impossible to find a real pattern. We don't know when they get more uh, pathogenic. We don't know when they lower their pa pathogenic activity. And there's a whole spot here that is, it's not even studied yet. So this is what we would like to do. We'd like to study this area, but we would also like to solve this whole thing because we believe if we do this systematically, if we develop protocols for how to test this, find the real parameters for how to sort this whole, whole thing out, we can find the recipe for how to use antibiotics to specific infections and in this way lower their, their pathogenic activity and get a zone here that is actually to our benefit. So, if we go back to Matilda's case here, based on the documentary that DR did, the, the Danish regions went together and made a, a initiative to to enhance the, the, the situation for, him, for patients that come in with infections like this. And part of their initiatives was to train nurses and train medical staff to be able to spot inf the deadly infections better and be able also to, to treat better. But what we would like to do with our research is to provide medical staff with better diagnostic tools. So it's really important that they get some real tools that enable them to detect early, to diagnose early, but also to be able to treat infections when they are not really treatable because they are resistant. So if we really listen to what the, uh, the World Health Org Organization is saying and to how resistance is going to develop, maybe it's time that we don't insist on killing bacteria or them killing us. Maybe we can find another way and throw away our weapons and coexist in peace. Thank you.